one one thirteen in the morning. It's one hour and thirteen minutes into the day, into the twenty third day of March, two thousand twenty one. Uh, it's Tuesday, and I'm having some lunch. I had a dinner, well, a breakfast, a breakfast type of dinner, breakfast for dinner. Actually, no, I had, uh, dinner for breakfast. That's the way to say it. Uh, my parents' house, and now I'm having lunch. It's, uh, I said, uh, it's about quarter past one in the morning. And I thought that now that I've got the new camera set up, uh, the way, got, the way it's working here, that I would uh, make my sandwich as I'm filming. And this is sort of the convenience the convenience of a short order menu is that you can essentially make uh, good food uh, without spending a lot of money. And that's kind of the goal here, is, is that uh, I do have a short order menu, and this is one of the short order menu items that I'm uh, making. It's a, a sandwich, it's a, using a Vietnamese bun. I'll be making a bon, bon mi. And uh, let's put some of this over here for now, and we'll get our knife, nice sharp knife blade. When you cut into your bread, what I'm doing now is I'm pressing down on the bread to flatten it out, and it makes it easier to cut. Done that. Going through it very easily. And we have cut through our bun quite nicely. Clean off the blade of the knife. So it's nice and clean when it goes back into its slot, into its holder. Time to switch things up a little bit. Here we go plated the sandwich where it needs to be. Uh, the next thing is to slice the cucumbers uh, for the sandwich. Let me get my knife. Alright, so I decided to do the put the uh, Mayo on first. There we go. I found for spreading condiments on a, a particular bun or something like that and then this even works for je for anything like jellies and so on and so forth uh, to get a better spread and better control over the amount that you put on the bun uh, I use a spoon I'm using a spoon here this is a sorry this is a long parfait a long parfait spoon and uh, let's sort of get this spread out. This is going to be a rather simple sandwich. It's not going to be anything complex.
And a lot of sandwiches can be very, uh, you know, elaborate. They can be, uh, have a lot of exotic meats in them and uh, flavors and so on and so forth. But the thing is, there's always, simple is always good too. There's no, nothing wrong with simple. It just again, the, depends on your approach. And for me, uh, in terms of what I like to eat, it depends on my mood. If I'm, what type of mood I'm in. Also, the weather. Uh, if it's uh, rainy out or uh, sunny out, these different things, these uh, these aspects uh, play into things. Now I'm going to cut the cucumber. Now I like using English cucumber. Now other people prefer lettuce. I prefer cucumber. And with the size of cucumber... Four or five slices usually does the trick. It's sufficient for the sandwich. And you notice it's not going to take me that long to finish the sandwich. To actually finish making the sandwich. It takes a bit of time because I am talking to you. We're having that conversation so my focus sometimes isn't always where it needs to be in terms of I need a couple more slices, well, cut four slices rather than the five slices I wanted. So we'll cut the fifth slice. As I said, this is where you can start traveling around the world, trying out different cultures, different spices, different uh, flavors. Here's the fifth slice. And there's a proper spread. Sandwich making can be an art in terms of how you layer your, how you layer your, flair, flair, layer your flavors. Of course, now it comes the egg. And that's why I use the egg machine, as I talked about it before. Well, to make, uh, I make seven eggs at a time. I usually take about two eggs per sandwich. And so, if I'm making seven eggs, I have one that's hot. And these eggs are either room temperature, room temperature or cold. And what happens is the, the process is basically a steaming process. You steam the eggs. And so it doesn't, because you're not using a lot of water, the water heats up, it boils, it get, the steam is produced. And you get a good temperature in the, uh, in the egg maker so that you can uh, actually go through the egg pro through the, uh, hard boiling process pretty quickly. Now I noticed, <laughs> and this is kind of um, what you get with, uh, I guess we call it modern convenience, is that places like Costco are selling pre-boiled hard eggs. Pretty sure Walmart's going to do the, end up doing the same thing. It's, it's the hard-boiled egg without the uh, hassle of actually having to boil it yourself. Pre-done. The thing is, given the number of people who eat out at Chick-fil-A 
because they don't want to bother cooking dinner. Kind of makes sense. But at the same time, if you're talking about eating healthy, uh, that's going to be kind of problematic because that's not exactly healthy eating. In here, there is an art to slicing uh, your 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 uh, food. No, well, I haven't tried, and I got it. Sorry about that. As you cook, you eat. What I got, bizarrely enough, is this: as a finger guard, so that when you're cutting, your fingers are in the way of the blade. But I don't always find it that convenient to do that. I haven't tried it yet, so but we'll see whether or not you actually have uh, something that's worthwhile. I know this, for things that are tricky to hold, like a hard-boiled egg, particularly near the end, there's always a bit of a risk. But if you go slowly... So I used to, I used to use uh, these slicing machines, the mandolins and stuff like that. But once I got good knives uh, and learned how to use them, I stopped using the mandolin. It was easier and more convenient for me to simply slice the egg myself uh, with a very good knife. And it has to be so like some, a blade like that does a very good job in terms of. Well, see, I have to hold it. On, I have to hold the egg like this. That's why I want to hold it. So, but so the finger guard doesn't really do anything for me. It's a nice idea, but right now there is no particular issue with the finger guard. And you have to hold it on the, you're holding it on the side so you're not uh, exactly holding it up and down so that your fingers, or well, that the one finger can fit inside the holder part. I guess that's where the issue is, is that you're going to hold, hold. that part then of course I guess the slicing would be an issue but if you're not going to do that and there's a left leftover piece and so I'm not going to throw it away and a little bit of salt and that's good. In this case here a little bit of salt on the sandwich And for eggs, I often put in a little bit of pepper. Let me get the pepper mill. Fresh ground pepper from a pepper mill is always better than pre-ground pepper. Move this over to the part where the sandwich, was the uh, I was doing the cutting. That's the center part of the board here. I'm going to put the sandwich together. And usually, when there's a tall sandwich, this is where you press down again to make sure that everything sticks together and, and things don't fall out of your sandwich while you're eating it. It takes a few seconds to press everything down. That's what I'm doing now. And then we'll move over to uh, uh, the back room and uh, continue on with the YouTube stroll. Whoa. 
Well, it was 8.30 on the 23rd. I didn't wait for the camera to stabilize, but anyways. Um, yeah, it's 8 hours and 37 minutes into the 23rd day of uh, March. I think it's Tuesday. Yes, yeah, Tuesday. And I'm in the kitchen once again. Vlogging in the kitchen. The work doesn't stop, and so I do have to eat. Well, because the work doesn't stop. And so I'm making myself a little something to eat. And it's a type of bread that I enjoy. It's made with a lot of ginger, so it actually... And <laughs> well, it is a bread. It is also a gingerbread. So it's, it contains both elements of the the, the 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 ginger and the bread element, if you will. Uh, well, typically uh, gingerbread cookies are are actually cookies. They're they're not actually a bread. These are. A bread rather than a cookie but the flavors are uh, comparable and so I use it as such I just have to cut scoring and then hold it like this and you follow the score down. Until it comes out is uh, two slices. So that's that. And now I'm going to put uh, some cream cheese on it. Uh, my meditation uh, regimen allows for this because I do have issues with my eyesight. And milk uh, seems to be uh, pretty good with the eyesight. I do seem to be able to sort of uh, improve my eyesight with this. So <laughs> if your goal is to sort of improve what you can do or, or maintain your eyesight, particularly as you get older, and these things become more difficult. Oh, with age, you're going to lose your eyesight. Well, I don't want to do that, you know. A large chunk of my work involves my eyes. I do a lot of observational work. Although you can see with your ears, and this is what I talked about with the sheep and the goats at the farm. Uh, I was doing observation with my ears, not not uh, my uh, not my eyes. And to my surprise, uh, the sheep were uh, pretty much a lot like people, and. Without looking looking at them, the behaviors were very similar. They had arguments, they had disagreements, and so on and so forth. And far beyond uh, what biologists would consider to be instinctual behavior, or instinctive behavior, this was far from that. These were open arguments that occurred over particular views, <laughs> well, I would consider them views and ideas. You know, I mean, going over to another field through a hole in the fence that someone had, one of the uh, sheep had found, is an idea. To argue over the idea, the concept of, of going over the fence is not instinctual. No, no one is sort of... <laughs> No one has pre-programmed it into the into the animal, and so one can make the argument for a behavior, a sense of existence for the animal, the sheep, the sheep, that really doesn't have a parallel in any of the biological texts. And this can be, you know, in terms of a, a biologist or other people who are intellectually minded and can't see through their own sense of self. And this includes Lionel LeBron, who is right now struggling with his identity because the events that are going on now are, beyond, are significantly beyond his logic. 
And as he tries to make sense and logic of it, doesn't understand that that people, as much as they claim to be logical, are primarily emotional. And what you see in Lion LeBron is you see the battle between his intellect and the emotion. And the thing is, is that people say, well, why do you watch him? He's kind of, you know, a nut job or whatever. He's part of these conspiracy theory groups. And he doesn't consider himself to be one. Uh, ironically enough, uh, he, and you know he'll deny this, and but if you watch his show, what if you watch, if you've been able to watch and go back to his original stuff, uh, he really has a sort of uh, a Bernie Sanders outlook on things. He is definitely not of the Republican mind, although more and more his views are indeed becoming conservative. It's as he explored into things that he thought were good ideas, and sort of watched how they evolved, uh, his opinions and ideas sh uh, changed. And you can see this over a period of time. You can watch him and watch the change in his behavior, watch the change in his, his opinions, uh, and you can watch him go from essentially a Bernie Sanders supporter to a Trump supporter. So you ask the question, well, how does someone, you know, why does someone end up supporting Trump? Are they all right-wing conservatives? And then they think, is the answer is no. So how does he end up in the QAnon thing? Well, and that's because in many cases, QAnon was completely misunder misunderstood. It was, it was taken completely out of context which typically happens in most political discussions. The opposition will take something completely out of context and use it for their own particular advantage. This is, this is what occurs in politics. In many cases, politics is designed to stir your emotions, to get you to move on something that uh, typically you wouldn't ordinarily move on. Uh, <laughs> but that's the nature of what we call provocative writing or a provocative position in terms of provoking somebody, particularly in, in terms of anger, getting them to do something that they wouldn't, wouldn't ordinarily do. And what you have in both Edward Bernays and, and, and um, Sigmund Freud, because uh, Ed, Edward Bernays was uh, Sigmund Freud's nephew, and a large chunk of the political work and the sort of the whole so-called the creation of the creation of public relations. He developed a, a, a phrase which is very accurate today, and it's called the manufacturing of consent. Other people that have done the work and having given the due due the due credit to uh, Edward Bernays to kind of keep him in the shadows. But then again, these people are designed to promote themselves and. <laughs> And they're not going to bring up Edward Bernays if they, if they can, if, if someone can steal an idea and present it as their own and get away with it, and they make some money off of it, they'll do it. The level of ethics that uh, sort of infects today's world, and that is also true of the past, but it seems to be more true of today than it is in other times. Um. Now, other times, you would have straight-up war. Now, you can't have straight-up wars. You have to create the need for the war. You have to create the environment for the war. This is the attack on the Chinese. This is the sort of the anti-Asian uh, sentiment. This is creating a war against China. Uh, this is uh, what you see between the blacks and the whites. Uh, the whole Af the, the Black Lives Matter created a gap where it was okay to go attack the, 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 anyone who was Asian. Because, oh, you know, all the Asians, they all look alike, they're all Chinese. Well, to a certain degree, that's true, but the reality is that's not the case, and everyone comes from their own particular backgrounds. Uh, they don't understand how, how diverse China is in terms of the 1.5 billion people, not to not, uh, let alone the Asian sphere, which includes the, the pan-Asian sphere, the whole Asian sphere, Goes all the way from the west, from uh, from Greece down to uh, uh, to Iran, 
and then over as you go to the to the as you go to the east you have India, Pakistan, and all the way up to the Himalayan mountains. That's your Central Asians, your Central Asia. Then you have the East Asians. That's the Chinese, the Japanese, and, and you have a sort of in between called Indochina. And that's in between. And this is Vietnam, Thailand, um, um, Malaysia, and then of course you have into the Polynesian islands. And again, you, again you have another mix that are, that are there. So it, the world is quite complex. It's not a simple thing, but to, politics tends to simplify it in order to create a view for particular, particularly for war. This is how they get people to go to war. They get people to go to war because they're convinced that these people are your enemy. They're going to attack you. They're going to put you in slavery. You know, into slavery. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. They're attacking other people. We need to go protect them, right? And this is this was actually was in Vietnam. Why did we go to Vietnam? We went to Vietnam to protect the Vietnamese. Why? From from who? From themselves. <laughs> this is the Western logic. This, is, but again, this is all, in many cases, this is a large chunk of of even ancient logic. When they went to war, you went to war for some particular cause, and it not, didn't necessarily be, have to be true. The whole crusade was complete work. Uh, and if you go look at it, you see that, that who were they fighting? They weren't fighting the Muslims. They were fighting the Christians. They were, well, you're going you're, you're gonna to come with us and we're going to protect you, but you have to do what we say. This is how how Europe became Europe, is that the, the, the Roman Catholics conquered everything and forced everyone to convert at the point of a sword. There were other Christian groups before that, particularly the Eastern Christians. But they were all wiped out. By the by, the Roman Catholics, who sent and the Pope at that time, about one thousand eight A.D. said he was Christ on earth, he was God incarnate, and he forced this will at the point of a sword, and not much different from a jihad. Well, the fact that you know changed the language into to Latin, and you that's what you have. We had a holy war. That's a jihad. It's a different language, different usages. Well, not, slightly different usages. Uh, different types of gods <laughs> fighting fighting wars in the name of God. So, anyways, uh, done my I've done my uh, food, and now I'm going to uh, go watch some TV.